Again, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on Sunday. We have a very busy Sunday in our temple today, right? Virtually. Uh, we had sisterhood sharing the recipes. I uh, hopped in for like 10 minutes. I heard some really good stuff there. And again, religious school and uh, now this uh, Judaism one-on-one. -on -one. So I want to also welcome our first timers uh mallets who are joining us they had a baby very recently so even though you guys don't have to don't feel pressured to uh, show us the baby but uh, of course i would welcome if you do uh, you, please. Uh, oh there you are oh good, oh, good morning oh. so, again. <laughs> so wonderful to see the Thank new you. generation the, co the COVID generation. <laughs> the new, newest member of Temple Shalom. Yes. yes. Yep. So again, don't feel pressured to stay on the camera the whole time. It's totally up to you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start sharing the screen um, because I have quite a, um, a lot of material. Now, if you see something on my email that like, you know, <laughs> it's my personal email, so <laughs> don't mind that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I should uh, should have flagged. Uh, okay, here we go. Oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. Oh, it opened up, but no. Oh, okay, hold on one second. Let me go back. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, let me ask you, which commandments do you personally think that you observe? And again, no pressure. Which commandments do you think you observe? No tirtzach. No Elana. Good one. Okay, which means which means don't, you shall not kill. All right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> The one down. Okay, what else? Uh, mitzvah. I work at the soup kitchen. At least I used to. <laughs> ah, okay. Which brings me actually to the question: What is mitzvah? How do we define mitzvah? I a thought it's doing a good deed. <laughs> ah, okay. So uh, let me clarify that. Um, and a lot of children also in religious school when I ask, uh, "What is mitzvah?" They say good deed. And that's what we learn, uh, or, well, I didn't go to religious school. That's what you guys learn in religious school, right? So mitzvah is a good, you're associated with a good deed. But mitzvah literally means commandment. And uh, we have 613 mitzvot, which were defined actually by Maimonides. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but mitzvah is really a commandment. Why do we associate it with a good deed? is because there are some commandments that uh, um, encourage us to do something good to people, right? Mm -hmm. And also there are two types of commandments. There, uh, there is a commandment that is called mitzvah aseh and mitzvah lota aseh. I know that Ilana knows exactly what I just said. So yeah. it means uh, the commandment that you shall do or you shall not do. So the positive and the negative. So can you give me an example? What, like the uh, example, for example, uh, the example, for example, example for a positive commandment, you shall do, what would that be? You shall observe the Shabbat. Nice. And the example for you shall not do? You shall not steal. You shall not steal, very good. You, you, you shall not steal, I mean, pretty obvious, right? That's a, that's a very clear commandment, which um, uh, is part of 10 commandments. So we pretty much know all the 10 commandments and they're clear, they're very straightforward, right? So let's look at those 10 commandments. So the first <laughs> commandment, let's review them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage, which means we shall believe in God, right? We have to I believe jump in, in on the Ten Commandments. I'm sorry? Can I jump in on the Ten Commandments? Yes. There's one that's not entirely clear, oh. at least in uh, only one. Uh -huh. 
I think it's, you, I believe it's you shall not murder. And I think that's very different than you shall not kill. Right, you, you're, you're correct. So we'll, we'll get there. Uh, and uh, again, because we have one hour, since I have another program, 1215, uh, we'll try to like, you know, capture everything uh, which will be very hard, but you know, I, I hope I will answer all the questions at the same time. So second commandment, you shall have no other gods beside me, which is the main principle of Judaism. When we say Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Had, here Israel, uh, our Lord is God, our God is one, right? So mm -hmm. that that is pretty clear, right? You think it's straightforward? Yeah. Yeah, and you shall not make for yourself any idols and so on and so forth. So that's a pretty clear commandment. Now, third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does it mean? You shall not take the name of God in vain. So what do you think it means? One of the things that it means to me is I don't say a bracha unless I'm going to do something that's associated with that bracha. Okay. You don't say something negative about God. Right. We're like, you know, when we um, when we do something with, oh, God, yeah. or, you know, it, it is sort of like a habit. But at the same time, you know, we shouldn't be bringing God when it's just like something mundane. And, you so know. that's a mitzvah none of us is going to fulfill. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a habit. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, fourth commandment, also pretty straightforward. Remember the Sabbath to so keep it holy. And by the way, we'll uh, later on, if we have time, we'll focus on the 39 Torahitic uh, ways of observing Shabbat, uh, which is uh, very different from now, but uh, we'll look at that. So remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, six days to so labor. So when, that one is pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fifth commandment, my absolute favorite, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long, right? And so, I mean, th this is also an obvious thing to honor your father and mother. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Ilana had already mentioned that, that she's not, that she is fulfilling this commandment. She, she, she's not murdering. <laughs> Seventh commandment, uh oh, you shall not commit adultery. So, um, you know, that's uh, one of the 10. What are you going to say? Um, eighth commandment, you should not steal. Uh, I think I want to mention that one also, somebody else. And then um, um, the ninth is you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does that mean? Saying something. Don't gossip. Uh, right were like wrongly accused someone of something, yeah. right? Without mm -hmm. any evidence. And the 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor his wife, his manservant, so on and so forth. What, what does that mean? It shouldn't be not envious. To, yeah, don't, don't desire what um, somebody else has. And you right. don't. Right, exactly. Don't. In other words, be content with what you have. You shouldn't be um, envious of other people because, you know, the neighbor's grass is always greener, but you should be content with what you have. Now, um, a couple should of- told that to King David. Yeah. Say it again. You should have told that to King David. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, King David who, well, but, uh, you know, at the same time, if he wouldn't be with uh, Bathsheba, then uh, we wouldn't have King Solomon, right? So um, the couple of you who had attended my Torah study class, you already have seen this uh, uh, really cute and funny representation of by uh, the group, uh, Israeli group of actors, the Jews are coming, um, their interpretation of Ten Commandments. So Mark brought up something about, you know, you can interpret in a, a couple of ways in terms of the commandment of you shall not kill. So there is a group of actors in Israel they call the Jews are coming. And um, um, they basically reinterpret or make, make a little bit of a sarcasm on uh, uh, not only various uh, aspects in Jewish life, history, 
uh, also uh, uh, different uh, ancient rabbis and uh, uh, middle uh, age interpreters, uh, but I mean, literally everything um, on Torah and Tanakh, everything. And uh, so this one is actually set, uh, um, uh, translated, uh, translated with subtitles to English. And I really wanted to share this one with you. So um, I think Ilana Allen and uh, Marsh already have seen it, but uh, uh, again, I think that this would be a good one for this particular group. So, um, <laughs> אדוני. אז כן קוראים לו אדוני. לא, זה לא השם שלו אדוני. השם שלו מתחיל ב-י ונגמר ב-A. יוספה. לא, לא, נו. יודה. עזבו, לא חשוב, שאלה הבאה. לא תחמוד אשת רעך. זה אומר שאסור אפילו לחשוב עליה? נכון. אפילו אם היא ממש שווה? כן, גם אם היא ממש שווה. ואם אני מסתכל עליה וכל הזמן אומר לעצמי, אל תחשוב עליה, אל תחשוב עליה. זה עכשיו שאני חושב עליה? אני לא יודע, אני אברר לך את זה. אבל תברר, כי אני לא רוצה ליפול פה על סתירה לוגית. עוד שאלות! זה בקשר לכבד את אביך ואת אמך. נו, באמת. ומה אם נניח אבא שלי רצח מישהו תוך כדי שהוא חושב על אשתו, השבה של השכן? צודק, אם זה המצב, אז אל תכבד. בסדר? עוד שאלות. לגבי הלא תרצח. מה לא ברור בלא תרצח? למה צריך להתווכח על כל דבר? לא תרצח, לא תרצח, מה לא ברור פה? זה כולל עמלקים? כי אתה ביקשת שנמחה את זכרם. עכשיו, כשאני מוחה זכר, אז אני עושה את זה בעזרת uh, רצח. אז אני מפספסת פה משהו. צודקת, שימי את העמלקים בצד. לא תרצח, לא, לא כולל עמלקים. ופלישתים. כן, וחיטים. ומורים. ויבוסים, וגרגסים. אבל זה לא מה שאמרתי. אבל אתה ביקשת מאיתנו שננקה את ארץ ישראל מכל מסוים. אבל זה לא מה שצריך ישר לרצוח אותם. אז בואו נעשה איתם, נשלח אותם לשייט. רבותיי, רבותיי, בסדר, בסדר, הבנתי, לא תרצח, למעט פלישתים, עמלקים, גרגסים, יבוסים, אמורים וחיטים. ומצרים. מה מצרים? מה מצרים? את ראית פעם מצרים בארץ כנען? אתה רצחת פעם מצרים, מה? אז למה לך מותר ולנו לא? מה, אתה יותר טוב מאיתנו? מה זה? לא, הנה, תראו אותו, כן, מה, מסתובב לו בעולם, רוצח איזה מצרי שבא לו, אבל לנו לא. לנו אסור, למה? כי הוא כושל, והוא יכול לרצוח את מי שבא לו. לא, תרצח! לא, תרצח! מה לא ברור ולא? תרצח! תרצח! פשוט לא! עוד שאלות? לא, לא. אנחנו ברשותך נלך לעבוד את אלוהינו. לחשוב עליה אם היא מתה זה לא נחשב, נכון? זה יכול להיות כבר! אוקיי, אז נו. אני מקווה שאתם אהבו את האינטרפרטציה של עשרה קומנדמנט. אז זה רק מראה שיש תמיד עוד מיני 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 מ Rabbi? Right, exactly. So on the tali, wait, hold on, let me show you. So I have this Tony's, uh, uh, Tony's tali, the real one from the wool, right? It's supposed to be made of the wool. So as you can see, We have those four long corners and many, many, many tzitzim, right, fringes. So between all of the fringes and all of the knots, there's total of 613. 
You can okay. count if you don't trust me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so they are reminding us when we pray in the morning because we put talit really um, in the morning. The only time we put it at night would be kol nidre, kol nidre night, right? Uh, but otherwise we only put it in the morning for shaharit prayer. Uh, so it reminds us of the 613. Now, let's take a look at uh, the uh, 613 as uh, traditionally they're stated. Wait, hold on, let me actually take them from Maimonides. And again, remember that I mentioned about uh, mitzvah ase and mitzvah lot ase, right? So, the uh, you shall do or you shall not do. So there are 613, and I'll just briefly uh, show you what type of the um, commandments they are by sections. And uh, this is the way that Maimonides uh, really uh, put them together. They're also called the codes uh, or um, um, they, they were widely accepted by majority of the rabbis. There were some that, you know, said, well, who are you to uh, come up with that and say that this is, oops, sorry. Uh, wait, how do I exit this? No, I don't want to know name, not yet. Ah! <laughs> the upper or the X, hit the I, X. I know, but uh, I, have, I have the screen. I have the, okay, I have your screen here. Okay, here we go, all right. Uh, now, okay, we're back. So the uh, fundamentals of the Torah, those are the commandments that have to do with fundamentals of the Torah. Uh, to know there is a God, not to entertain thoughts of other God besides him, to know that he is one, so that's pretty clear. Laws of character, to emulate his ways, to cleave to those who know him. And I can send this or you can Google them, you know, it's, uh, um, I just wanna go over the, um, uh, again, the um, uh, just major topics. Laws of Torah study, to learn Torah, to honor those who teach and to know Torah. Laws of the idolatry and paganism. So clearly we'll talk about the uh, uh, not to worship any other gods from the small letter G, not to prophesize in the name of idolatry. So it's just, I, I don't want to start reading all of them. That will take a lot of time. So many commands on that. Laws of repentance, hmm. to repent and confess in wrongdoings. Mostly, when do we do that? Yom Kippur. Oh, Yom Kippur, exactly. Uh, Book of Love of God, laws of reading the Shema. So we have to say, to say Shema twice, <laughs> that is very important. And uh, in the Talmud, there is a huge section that's devoted when uh, we're supposed to say Shema. I'm actually uh, studying it uh, with my Hivruta, with my uh, partner in the Talmud. We, we try to get together at least once a month and to study, and <laughs> we've been sitting on that for a while already. Lords of prayer on Kohanic blessing, the priestly benediction, right? Um, laws of Tefillin and Mezuzah and uh, the Book of Torah. So Tefillin, uh, we know who what Tefillin are, right? The um, let me see, do I have them? Uh, boxes, uh, like a boxes that we put on one on the forehead, one on the arm. Uh, you've seen the uh, Orthodox Jews and the conservative Jews do that. Sometimes some reformed Jews do that also. And Mizuzah is uh, uh, the, this uh, little box that we put uh, to the entrance of our house on the doorpost or sometimes uh, to our bedroom, the dining room. Uh, what's in common between the tefillin and Mizuzah? Anyone knows? The Ahavta. Yeah. Right. So what, what about it? It's in, inside it. Very good. So the, the scroll, the little scroll that's inside of Mezuzah and uh, Tefillin, both Tefillin actually, uh, it starts with Shema and continues with Ahavta. Uh, and it's on the scroll that also has to be from the same, uh, you know, uh, um, the same uh, uh, as uh, Torah from the uh, skin of animal. So that, that would be considered kosher, right? So uh, as a reminder uh, for us to uh, remember not only commandments, but also to uh, teach, uh, to, to lo love God and to teach about uh, loving God to the next generation. 
so this is very important. And uh, on both, uh, also another thing in common, on both mezuzah and tefillin, we have letter shin, which stands for Shaddai, which is another name of God, uh, <laughs> which reminds me uh, this segment that we watched. Uh, so, so what's his name? <laughs> uh, and then, I have a, yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. yeah, I have a question too. When I was a child, my grandfather gave me a mezuzah to wear as a piece of jewelry. A jewelry? Oh, okay. And then years later, somebody said, we shouldn't wear it as jewelry because you never know when you go into a bathroom or someplace that's a quote unquote clean. So you shouldn't be walking around with that. If, have you heard that? No, first time, what I, but I do know that there is a commandment that you cannot say Shema, for example, in a place that's like, you know, not smelling well or right. so that possibly. Yeah, but did you, you have, have the scroll inside? Because if you I think it was there when he first gave it to me. And then I looked one day and it was empty and I got very upset. So it's in a, it's in the safety deposit box because it's all gold. But, you know, um, it was very special when he gave it to me. Mm. So I think Alana is right. If there is no scroll in it, then it, it would be okay. It's just like a piece of jewelry. Uh, my daughter just gave me a little uh, scroll uh, and a wooden box uh, to wear on my keys. Mm -hmm. And it has, the, it has the scroll in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never see, seen anything like that before, but it was just- um... well, Hopefully you don't take your keys to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, when uh, uh, if let's say you know you, you are praying right in the morning, you have taliton and the uh, tefillin. If you have to go to the bathroom, you have to remove all that and go to the bathroom without. So that's uh, also one of the halacha interpretation. It's not in the Torah. It doesn't say in the Torah. I have to remove talit. <laughs> go to the bathroom. So and that's also, why we have the hooks outside the men's room and ladies' room in temple. Right. And you don't and you don't put a mezuzah on the door to the bathroom, right? Right. <laughs> uh, right. So, um, which, by the way, reminds me of uh, uh, the di uh, different differentiation between the Torahitic laws and uh, rabbinic laws, right? So we have to remember that some of the laws are in the Torah that we still uh, observe, like you know, observe Shabbat. Um, and there are rabbinic laws that came much later and evolved with centuries. And we talked about it, I think, our last session as well. Uh, so it's important to uh, differentiate between these two. Mm -hmm. Now, laws of tzitzit, they have tzitzit on four corner garments. Laws of blessing, to bless the Almighty after eating and the other, um, other times. Laws of circumcision. Uh, book three, the book of seasons. So laws of the Shabbat. There we have main rest, uh, not to do prohibited work. Uh, the court must not inflict punishment on Shabbat, not to walk outside the city. Uh, boundary on Shabbat, um, sanctify the day with Kiddush and Havdalah. Um, uh, by the way, so we, we talked a little bit about it last time also. Uh, in which occasion can we um, uh, break the rules of Shabbat? Save the life. Yes. To save the life, exactly. Exactly. When we need to save the life, then any Shabbat laws can be uh, broken. Uh, rules of Eruvin. So like I said, there are some laws that are rabbinical, and we talked about it last time, I think. So, um, you know, the, the Jews are very smart, right? I mean, we know that. So they, they are so smart that they make the laws, and then they figure out the ways to go around those laws. So if you, for example, not supposed to carry on Shabbat, uh, they came up with, uh, I think it's uh, more or less modern, maybe, uh, I don't know, 200 years or so, 300. So they put like a, a boundary around a, a neighborhood uh, where they live and it's called the Iruv. So um, for example, in uh, Riverdale, I, I think there was like a, some uh, um, thing about uh, the damaging the the um, uh, electric poles because they, they use mm -hmm. electric poles to uh, put this wire and or whatever the thread whatever they do uh, so that if they want to go to neighbor's house right and bring some food um, or carry lulav to synagogue on shabbat uh, they can do that as long as uh, the area is uh, 
surrounded by this uh, wire and they called okay oh this is like just one household this is uh, we can still carry within within this area did, did it also have to do with carrying babies carrying yeah. babies yeah. that's right carrying babies and, yep. you know by extension if you could say you can break the laws of shabbat to save a life not that it's maybe the same degree but the the thinking is the same yeah, pikuach uh, nefesh is the Hebrew expression for saving the life, pikuach nefesh. So, uh, I mean, as if carrying a baby is a work. I mean, well, it's sort of work, but... Uh, You're nurturing a life. Yes, exactly. Then the laws of Yom Kippur and the rest. I'm, I'm going to move along because we have 613, right? Laws of festival rest. Laws of uh, Hametz and Matzah, the whole separate section, uh, section, right, for Passover. Laws of Shafar. Sukkah and Lulav. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, uh, it talks about who is supposed to uh, do this mitzvah, uh, do this commandment, and who, who has to hear it, and so on and so forth. Uh, laws of Shkalim, uh, Shekel is a coin, right, of um, uh, money. Laws of sanctification of months, laws of fasts, laws of Megillah and Hanukkah. That you had to give. I'm sorry? There was a percentage of income you had to give, perhaps in addition to the shekel. Right. Uh, laws of Megillah and Hanukkah are rabbinical. Why do you think it says rabbinical? The Megillah and Hanukkah. Megillah meaning uh, Megillat Esther. Why do you think they are rabbinical and not Torah? They came after the Torah. Exactly. exactly. Right. They're well, not in the Torah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, now, the book four is a book of women. <laughs> we, we get a whole special separate book, <laughs> ladies. So, uh, laws of marriage, divorce, uh, Yivum and the uh, Chalitza, uh, Mary, uh, childless mother's widow. So, you know, uh, and again, uh, if you want, I can send the link or you can Google on your own and uh, read all of them by yourself. Laws of women, um, and you can see here. A laws of uh, sota, it's a suspect of a wife. What is the wife can be suspected of? Adultery. Right. Now, we don't have that for men. Discrimination, right? <laughs> mm. uh, book, book of Holiness, laws of forbidden relations. Wow, that's a whole list of forbidden oh. relations. Wow. We, we, can, we can guess some of the things that may, may be listed. Oh, that's a lot, right? So. They compile a lot of commandments. So I think so far you already found some things that you do or don't do, right? <laughs> <laughs> laws of forbidden food, and we talked in uh, lots of detail last session. Uh, it is recorded, by the way, so if you want, you can always watch it over. Uh, so laws of kashrut, laws of slaughtering. And uh, uh, the, uh, that is something that the uh, shochet, right? The, uh, a uh, Jewish butcher would uh, have to follow when uh, killing an animal in a Jewish way. So the animal is kosher uh, to eat. Book six, the book of oaths, laws of oaths, not to swear falsely in God's name. So, and by the way, the, again, it reminds us of the Yom Kippur, uh, of uh, all the oaths that uh, we want to be free of on the Yom Kippur, laws of vows, laws of the Natsir must let his hair grow. Uh, Natsir is um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the who, who, who serves in the temple. Natsir is what? Uh, a person who serves in the temple. Uh -huh. um, laws of estimated values and vows. Uh, hold on. I just want to make sure I give you the right information. And book seven, the book of seeds. In other words, how to plant the seeds, laws, uh, the laws of mixed species. So uh, the ways how to uh, plant, uh, not to mix. So, you know, we have, uh, nowadays we have a lot of like hybrid uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, but uh, uh, those laws say that we shouldn't mix. Uh, laws of gifts to the poor. Oh, correction, that's it, is an, um, uh, a court official. So Jews couldn't ride a mule? A mule is a cross between a donkey and a horse. Um, no, you couldn't do the cross. Question. It doesn't say you can't. 
Or you could, so you just buy it, buy it from the Goyim? Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> But long as you're not responsible for the mating of the two, you're okay. <laughs> That's what it looks like. So then laws of uh, Maser. Uh, of the planting. And uh, hold on, let me move on one second. Uh, laws of the second teeth and the fourth year. Um, so besides the uh, seventh year, right? We know that we have to let the land rest on the seventh year, or seventh year, and then the jubilee year. I believe jubilee is the fiftieth year. On the fiftieth year, we have to let the land rest. Also, uh, maaser is a teething. Uh, it means teething also, like a t i t h i n g. Laws of the sabbatical and jubilee year. So. Sabbatical is the seventh year and Jubilee is the 50th year. Yes, not to work to soil during the 50th year. So literally you have to let the land rest. Now it all only concerns uh, Israel. If you're uh, doing this uh, in diaspora outside of Israel, it doesn't apply. It really only applies to Israel. But it's probably a good idea. To let the land rest, sure. Yeah. Yeah. At least to rotate the crops. Yeah. Right. Book eight is the book of services, so laws of the temple, um, and the, you know, meaning the uh, first and the second temple. Uh, so that means that this this is not applying to us, right? So this is already uh, these are laws that we don't have to uh, follow now. Uh, laws of temple vessels and employees. Again, those uh, are all the commandments that are not really uh, something that we need to be concerned with now. Laws of entering the temple, right? Again, we talk about Kohen, uh, Kohanim, the priest, the priest dy dynasty. Um, so again, a bunch of laws that uh, we don't need to be concerned with now. Laws of restrictions concerning sacrifices. Do we need them now? No. No, a whole Thanks. bunch, look how many. Lots of artificial procedure. Look how many of those. Goodness. A whole bunch. Um, laws of constant and additional offerings. Do we need those now? No. no. Mm -mm. Laws of disqualified offerings. Do we need them? No. 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 Uh, now, laws of Yom Kippur services. Yes. So let's go back for a sec to um, the laws of uh, offerings and the sacrifice and so on and so forth. So. Uh, after the destruction of the second temple, uh, the, uh, uh, the power of uh, decision-making in terms of the laws uh, shifted from Kohanim, from the priests, to the rabbis. Uh, and even though, of course, there were uh, rabbis in time of temple, but they weren't ones that would be leading in worship, right? It would be the priests. So it was decided by uh, the rabbinic court that uh, uh, as a part of mourning of the destruction of the temple, uh, there will be no more sacrifices and uh, they will not resume until the temple will be rebuilt. And when are we saying, when, when, when do uh, Orthodox and conservative, well, I think, yeah, conservative too, when do they believe the temple will be rebuilt? When the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes, exactly. Now, it's really an unknown time. We cannot predict, by the way, Reformed Jews do not believe in that particular uh, uh, thing <laughs> that Messiah will come and, you know, resurrect the dead and uh, they'll all, the righteous will go to Jerusalem, the temple will be rebuilt. But those who do, they continue to study those laws, even though, of course, they don't have to follow them. But the, all of these laws, they continue to study just in case Messiah comes and, uh, you know, they leave to that moment. And so that uh, they keep those laws uh, still uh, uh, alive. And uh, uh, in other words, uh, you know, they, they still practice, not practice, still, still learn and teach them so that they're prepared or they're preparing the next generation who will be lucky enough to live to the time when Messiah comes. All right. Uh 
Don't perform Jews from believing in that. Well, I'm sorry? Some what stopped reform Judaism from believing that Mashiach will come? Yeah, it's a, um, it's a really philosophical. It's just, you know, we, uh, and I'll try to explain it. We'll, we just uh, have a hard time believing in that sort of a miracle of, uh, um, you know, the actual resurrection. And uh, we just have a hard time really uh, uh, accepting that. Um, and so we believe that also since uh, Israel uh, already exists as a country and Jews uh, have a right to come back to Israel and Jerusalem. So in a way we already have the, you know, the temple there, but um, um, it's just, uh, again, you know, we, we're, we just don't believe in uh, the coming of Messiah. So I'll, I can do another class on that. So we can look more closely. How about that? Okay. All right. So next time we'll do Messiah. It's a good topic. Um, lots of misu misusing uh, sanctified property. Uh, and going back to the laws of sacrifice. So out of 613, we have close to 400, like 370, I would say, that deal with uh, sacrifice. So you guys already off the hook from that many. So that, you know, that doesn't leave too many, right? I mean, about uh, about 200 something, over, over 200. So it's not so bad. Are there any one-to-one -one correlations anywhere between prayers and sacrifice? I mean, we've told in a very general sense, prayers have replaced sacrifices, but yes. a lot of very specific sacrifices. Right, so yes, yeah, so correct. So the fact that we pray three times a day one of the reasons is because it's based on the three times a day that uh, Kohanim, the uh, priests, would uh, uh, make the sacrifice and uh, would uh, burn the altar. Uh, so three times a day. Uh, and therefore, the prayer that we have now is tied to and uh, um, substitutes the sacrifice. So we pray Shaharit morning, we pray uh, Mincha afternoon and Mariv evening. Um, as, uh, like I said, some of the rabbis interpret it as a uh, substitute for the sacrifice. Uh, the book of, uh, another book of sacrifice, laws of Paschal sacrifice, Paschal is a Passover, laws of pilgrim offerings, laws of firstborn animals, laws of offerings uh, for the uh, unintentional transgressions, laws of lacking atonement, laws of substitution of sacrifices. So again, a whole bunch, right? The book of purity, Laws of impurity of human dead, laws of red <laughs> heifer, laws of red heifer, by the way, uh, the uh, red heifer is, uh, there is a belief that also um, the, the red cow, right, is the, uh, is the most uh, pure uh, type of the cow. And uh, um, also, uh, did, did anybody read the uh, uh, Jewish Police Union? I think that's the name of the book. Anyone read the Jewish Police Union? It's a really cool book. I, I recommend strongly, but uh, it, it talks about uh, the red heifer and uh, uh, supposedly uh, this uh, person who, uh, who was the Messiah, but he gets killed. Anyways, uh, very interesting uh, and uh, with uh, sort of like a dark humor. Um, there's another belief that uh, once someone discovers a complete blemishless uh, red heifer, a complete red cow, uh, it, it, is, it is also the sign that the Messiah is somewhere near. Um, laws of impurity through tzara'at, uh, laws of the impurity of reclining and sitting, which is a little strange, but uh, you know, we, are, we talk about the impurity of uh, women here that um, have the menstrual period that uh, we know that they have to stay away from husband uh, for a week. And then uh, after they're sure everything is clear, they go to the mikveh, right? Um, in period of childbirth. So in, in the uh, ancient times, a woman would have to stay in her own tent away from husband um, and uh, uh, from other males or any house uh, chores so she gets purified. Lots of other sources of impurity, 
by that base. In other words, you know, not to touch that base. By the way, speaking of the uh, impurity uh, regarding dead, so Kohanim, the priests, are uh, not supposed to be in the presence of the dead body at all. Uh, so mm -hmm. up until now, actually, it still stands. Any of the uh, priests, uh, if, if you know that your last name is Kohen or Levi, you're not supposed to be in the presence of the dead body. Uh, and if you know a Levi too? Um, I actually no. I think it's just Kohanim. I think so. Yeah, I think just Kohanim. What is impurity by age short sin? Any idea? Um, it's four fifty nine. Yeah, hold on. What what are they short sin? Uh, some kind of a uh, what are they? Small animals. Uh, hold on, I'm finding it out. Um. Uh, it translates eight creeping things. The animal described as eight creeping things. So I guess the, the ones that uh, it's in Leviticus 11 verses 29-30. Um, so you, you're not supposed to touch them, I believe. Uh, while alive, the eight shatsim do not contain purity. However, when one of them has died and is touched or shifted by a human being, it conveys impurity to that person. If he were a priest of Aaron's lineage who touched the animal's corpse, he is forbidden to eat of the hallowed things until he is first immerses his body in mikveh. Just like with the uh, laws of kosher, if you happen to eat something unknowingly to you, something is not kosher, you can purify yourself uh, uh, by uh, immersing in uh, uh, mikveh or uh, taking a shower, just kidding. Um, so, and that would be in the laws of Mikwe also. The impure person must immerse himself in Mikwe. Book 11, the book of <coughs> damages, laws of property damage, it's pretty clear. Laws of theft, laws of robbery and lost objects, laws of murder and preservation of life. And book 12, the book of acquisition, laws of sales, and there we have some rabbinic laws laws of slaves. Again, that doesn't apply to us either. Book 13, the book of judgments, laws of hiring, laws of borrowing and depositing, laws of creditor and debtor, laws of plaintiff and defendant, laws of inheritance. Book 14, the book of judges. Uh, Sanhedrin is the um, rabbinic court and the punishments. <clears throat> Laws of evidence, laws of insurgents, laws of mourning, laws of kings and their wars, and that doesn't apply to us either, right? And that's it. So again, we have about 200 left. So don't stress out about them, about the rest, right? <laughs> now, Malachot of Shabbat. So uh, we talked about the laws of Shabbat. And uh, the, in the Torah, there are 39. So when we talk about not doing any work on Shabbat, what do we think of? Going, going to your place of work and doing... Uh, what you're supposed to do at work not, and not at home. Uh, Paid walk, we think about, right? It's a Say it again, Robert. Paid work. What does it mean? Something that you are enumerated for. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. So in other words, when we think Shabbat, we think we shall not do any work or, you know, we shall not drive. Well, reform drive, right? We can, uh, we can uh, use the transportation as reform Jews to get to places, uh, as long as uh, the place is synagogue, of course, just kidding. Um, what are the laws that you think you are observing on Shabbat or we should observe? Well, the concept of Shabbat is to be separate and set aside one day when you're not thinking about just the ordinary, but you're thinking about the extraordinary. Um, there was a prayer in the book that says, you know, we, we go from our own, you know, doing our own creation to thinking of the work of God's creation. And you know, I think it's important. It's an important context. And, right. Uh, 
separating the holy from the mundane, I think is the way to put, we go back to the work week. Yeah, so I, wanna... I, really think, I really think of an office walk and all this like field walk is not walk, it's gardening. <laughs> gardening is... So, you know, it's very... is worship. Right, Ilana, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's very uh, fine line. So what, you know, what, do, what do we consider work? And uh, that's why I think, you know, part of the benefit of being a reformed Jew that we can, uh, um, we can learn the laws, but at the same time, we can make a decision what really makes sense uh, in terms of our modern life because things that were um, uh, prohibited in the uh, Torahitic times, right? It, it, it's just, just like with sacrifice, it, it's just not viable to our modern life. And therefore we, we can't quite, you know, say that this is exact way how we observe Shabbat, uh, the same way that the Israelites had to do when they were uh, wandering in the desert or when they were even, you know, in the, in, living in the ancient, ancient Israel. So some of the 39 malachot, they're called 39 malachot, uh, field work, sowing, plowing, reaping, gathering and binding, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, shifting, kneading, baking. Uh, so no baking, we do all the baking prior to Shabbat. I mean, some of it makes sense, right? It's a hard work, it's a hard labor. All of this, it's not just like planting um, some flowers in your, uh, uh, flower bed, but uh, it is a hard work. And so a God, uh, a God uh, wants to uh, prohibit the, the Israelites from doing any of this so that they really can take time, can take one day at least a week and rest. Making material curtains. So in other words, sewing, right? Shearing wool, cleaning, combing, com dyeing, spinning, stretching the threads, making loops, weaving threads, separating the threads, tying a knot, uh, untying a knot, sewing, tearing. So, I, I, and again, I think that the tying a knot, it's not like, you know, I'm just uh, making up uh, on, um, I don't know, uh, the, the braid, but, uh, um, but uh, you know, it's part of the sewing because when you have to, after you put the thread in a needle, you have to tie a knot in order to sew. So that's why this is uh, part of the thing, right? So no sewing, no, nothing to do with material because sew is, is work making leather curtains. Uh, I mean, who is making leather curtains on, on a daily basis? <laughs> yeah, I don't think many of us, right? So, so all these laws of not making leather curtains, making the beams of the Mishkan, right? So all, I think part of this has to do with, oops, part of this has to do with uh, uh, tabernacles, the putting up and taking down of the Mishkan. Uh, the Mishkan's final touches. So as we can- You go to uh, the Mishkan final touches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of that um, is referred to today, such as the carrying. Yes. Kindling of a fire. That's been transferred. Yes, kindling of the fire, right. Exactly. You, thank you, Marsha. You're absolutely correct. So what does it mean in, in our modern days, kindling fire? Do we kindle fire? Yeah. Yeah. Start a car. How? How? Start a car, yeah. a stove, light switch. That's right. microwave. Light switch. Exactly. So um, if you are an observant Jew, you probably would uh, time uh, all of your uh, electronic devices in the house, right? So that the, uh, you don't have to uh, uh, turn on and off the switch. Or you can use a Shabbos boy. Do you know the term Shabbos boy? Yeah. What does it mean? It uses a, somebody else that's not Jewish to do your things. Somebody, yes. Yeah, so right. Run your elevators and uh, yeah, that's right. push the buttons. But what's interesting, in my daughter's neighborhood, uh, my daughter's Orthodox, uh, they do have a Shabbos boy who is very knowledgeable. Um, <laughs> a dedicated he really Shabbos is. boy. <laughs> he really is. Um, but what they say is they can't outright say to him, oh, the air conditioning is not working. They have to say to him, oh, it's so hot in the bedroom. I wonder if I can sleep tonight. And he has to interpret what they're saying to him. And then he'll turn on the air conditioner. 
right. Like I said, choose the smart, right? They they create yeah. the laws and then they find a way to uh, go around these laws so they can still do it, make make the life comfortable. In other words, mm -hmm. um, um, go ahead. It, it's the whole concept of turning on lights and off. Is that you're creating a spark, or is yeah. it that you're allowing electrons or electricity to happen? And if you can, you know, have electricity flowing and not flowing without a spark, does that make a difference? Yeah, they have something called a Shabbos slam, which they plug in and turn on. And then if you want to turn it off, there's an outer casing that you can move around the light. So you're not interrupting the electric flow or they leave their lights on, you know, yeah. for 25 hours. But again, isn't it in a way like hypocritical a little bit, wouldn't you say? I mean- You mean the Shabbos slam? The whole thing, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, so, no, yes and no. I mean. What the way they explained to me is we're not supposed to create something new on Shabbos. Mm -hmm. So every time you, um, you know, turn on a light, you're creating a new spark and that's creating something new. So that's how they look at it. Um, and it's also creating that fire, that electronic spark. So what about walking to shul versus driving to shul? And no, I've had the traditional, oh, oh no, I know that I know the Orthodox stone, but I also say, you know, if you have to walk, say half a mile, or, you know, so, something that's not ridiculous far, but doable, but isn't that more work than right. in our mind? It's, our I mean, mind it's good, not, but I mean, this but, is not know. about work, Dan. This is about uh, turning on the engine, also. I, I understand, and I think a lot of that had to do with giving the animals. In ancient times, arrest on Shabbat. Right. Yeah, you were not supposed to mount an animal uh, on Shabbat, right? But, but a car is not an animal. In yes. That object. <laughs> again, uh, again, you know, this is it's it's very hard if 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 we think about uh, really sticking to the laws of uh, you know uh, the Torahic times. So the rabbis were trying to reinterpret them, right? And uh, um, uh, refigure the, the whole halacha, the whole Jewish law, uh, trying to uh, adapt it to the uh, modern times. And of course, you know, it changes like with every, I don't know, every, what, 20, 30 years, 40 years, uh, something new comes up because we didn't have uh, smartphones uh, 30 years ago, right? So there probably uh, should be new laws regarding the smartphones. Well, there's just all the electronics that are turned off. Uh, Emily has a, a virtual friend who is uh, Orthodox, modern Orthodox, and she says he doesn't uh, post anything on Shabbat clearly. So, you know, apparently it's possible. I don't know how, but uh, <laughs> some Jews are capable of uh, getting their children not to use electronics for one day a week. Oh my God, <laughs> we should learn from them. So um, last few minutes left, do you have any questions? And I hope I will be able to answer if you have. Yeah, I have a question about the mezuzah because we have a neighbor here on a boat who has uh, bought a boat. Apparently at some point it was owned by Jews because there's a mezuzah on it. And I was wondering whether that's to stay or if it would be something that you would say should come off because it's not owned by a Jew anymore. So in, interestingly, yeah, so in general, uh, there's a law that you're supposed to leave your mezuzah. You're not supposed to uh, take it off after you leave. Oh. And it, I mean, it's, it's up to the next owner, but uh, you're supposed to leave mezuzah. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I guess also a comment. At times, I feel like we are diminishing the beliefs of others in these conversations and having lived in a variety of different ways observing Judaism. I think it's important to recognize that different people have different perspectives. Absolutely. I, I hope that I didn't diminish uh, what other people uh, uh, feel that is important to them to observe. And uh, I think that I mentioned that, you know, we have several denominations in Judaism. There is ultra Orthodox, Orthodox, modern Orthodox, um, conservative, reconstruction, reform. Um, and I think there, there's like some other new waves, but so there's so many. And of course we have to respect everybody. Not only uh, we should respect uh, the, uh, um, 
the ways that more observant Jews uh, lead their life, but uh, they should also respect the way that we, uh, the way that we follow um, what we believe and we're yeah. still Jews. We can only conduct ourselves, so I can't control anyone else. And I'm just voicing that sometimes because there are so many different people who observe so many different ways in reform Judaism, I think it's important for us to just really be more objective about some of the things that we're studying. Absolutely. I, I agree with you, Sarita. And I, I have spent many times as a reform Jew defending orthodox practices to other reformed Jews because you know I think we need to respect where they're coming from and we all have our paths to God and uh, the respect is a really important factor so thank you for sharing that right that's why I wanted to bring up all of the variety of the commandments and things that people do or don't do so that um, as a reformed Jews we don't uh, make our decisions best based on what is comfortable and convenient, but based on the knowledge and then uh, making the decision based on that. Yeah, and looking at each halacha from different perspectives, like walking to shul, I love that. That's not work for me. It's something that to Don's point, I think it was, lets me reflect and not be part of every day. Every day I'm hustling and I'm running and I'm doing. And on Shabbat, to be able to take a walk and look at Hashem's creations and notice pelicans and fish and alligators in the neighborhood that we're in right now mm -hmm. is a blessing. And it is part of Shabbat for me. Listen, if, if you have the luxury of living next to the shul or even if it's 15, 20 minute walk, why not? That'll be, you know, it's a good exercise too. Yeah, I think we're a little further in <laughs> Randolph, but I did it anyway. So it's just what you want to do on what day, right? Yeah. But it also goes to whether you have a disability where you can't walk. And Absolutely. I think there's a lot of things that need that kind of level of flexibility. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I often think that the Hasidic movement started as a reform revolutionary movement against what was traditional orthodoxy 200, 300 years ago, whenever the Baal Shem Tov you know, really brought a lot of joy into uh, what he saw needed reforming. And I think we're following in those same traditions. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Joe and Cynthia, can you remind me the baby's name? What's her name? Her name's Rachel. Rachel, oh, right, sorry. <laughs> I forgot for a second. So uh, yeah. we're probably looking into baby naming sometime in April, we were talking with Joe. So uh, hopefully you guys will be open to do it. And, uh, you know, by then maybe we'll be able to do it in person. Uh, and uh, we can do it as part of Friday night service. So everyone can meet um, Rachel at some point. And if yeah, not, then a later. Can you enlarge the picture so we can see her? <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Oh, she's beautiful. So beautiful. Okay. I even put my glasses on. For her. See, she's, <laughs> she started learning the Torah from a very early stage. Yeah. She may be at our, huh? <laughs> in the future. All right. So have a wonderful week, everybody. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Maddie, Bye. for your help. Oh, yeah.